Sorry. Um, Steve, will you open us in prayer? Sure. Father God, we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we want to learn from you. You know, your Holy Spirit is what reveals truth to us, and we call on you to, to teach and reveal and draw us ever closer to you, Lord. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, I have a booklet for you that we will be starting tonight. You may want to get a three-ring binder or a little folder that's got little things in it that you can uh, put three-hole binder type material in um, or get you some pocket sleeves. That's what I've done uh, with this. Uh, but you have a packet tonight uh, that I'll hand out uh, at, the end of at the end of our study. Uh, and uh, it will review what we've gone over tonight, uh, but it's also got some exercises in it uh, for you throughout the week. All right? Um, so, uh, last week we introduced the topic of spiritual disciplines, making it work on Monday, making putting feet to our faith. All right? And, and we, we touched on some, some very basic things, uh, one of which is it requires us to think differently than the way that we have been programmed uh, in order to believe and the first step of that in order to be in that is to know and believe that there is uh, a supernatural aspect to our faith that we have a supernatural God uh, and that the spirit world does exist uh, and that we have access to it uh, okay and we have access to it through the Holy Spirit uh, and uh, the spirit of life that has been breathed into us, okay? The spirit person that is who we are, all right? So this week, week two, is about meditation. Uh, and I'm going to share a real quick quote with you, uh, and it's from one of the resources that we use for, the, for this uh, study. It says, Faith and a disciplined mental life were not enemies then. Talking about our Christian forefathers. A well-formed mind held a place of honor, and it was believed that the Christian mind could be the best mind. Today's deadly philosophies are not the result of human intelligence and thinking, but rather thinking that is unyoked from the true knowledge that comes from above, from God. All right, and that's from J.P. Moreland, Love God with All Your Mind. All right, now, from your research this week, you were supposed to try to see how many scripture references you could find on meditation, all right? That's more for you uh, than anything, so that you see that it is biblical, okay? But from your research, you if you've done just any amount of research, it shouldn't have been very hard to find that there's a lot of scripture references about meditation, okay? Uh, which shows us right away just on surface level surface level that this discipline of meditation is indeed biblical okay um, as you can see meditation goes way back and it's very much a part of our Christian heritage all right uh, we're going to bring this point out even more here in just a little bit uh, but our Christian heritage goes all the way back to the Old Testament from the very beginning all right? Uh, you know uh, the 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 uh, Garden of Eden, all of that. That's all going to tie into the spiritual discipline of meditation. Between the Hebrew and Greek languages used in the writing of the Bible, six words are used to convey meditation. All right, and it will be part of your handout. Uh, I've I've done a word study for you. Well, I didn't do it. I just copied and pasted it. <laughs> All right, but uh, you'll you'll have access to the Hebrew words and the Greek words, uh, so that if you want to uh, go into an in-depth word study on those words, you can. Uh, but the various meanings that fall under meditation with the words that are used in the Bible mean things like listening to God's word, reflecting on God's works, rehearsing God's deeds, and ruminating on God's law, and more. All right. So those are just some of the definitions or some of the usage, usage of the words, those six words that uh, all come under uh, the purpose of conveying meditation to the reader. Okay? So when we're when, so we can already tell just, just introing the topic that meditation involves listening to God's word, reflecting on God's works, rehearsing God's deeds. 
and ruminating on God's law and more. In each case, there is a stress upon, if you look at each case in the Bible, in the Word of God, in each case there is a stress upon changed behavior as a result of our encounter with the living God. Change behavior as a result of our encounter with the living God. If there is an encounter with the living God and there isn't a change, something's wrong. Repentance and obedience are essential features in any biblical understanding of meditation. All right? And we're going to draw some lines in the sand tonight uh, that indicate the immense and significant differences between Christian meditation and the meditation methods uh, of other faiths and beliefs around the world. Okay? It is distinct and it is important. We're going to look at a few biblical examples. Like I said, there are a lot, and it would take up our whole hour to look at all of them. Uh, so we're just going to look at a few uh, biblical examples. Uh, Psalm 119, 97 through 102. And again, all of these scripture references will be in your packet, but if you want to follow along in your Bible, I encourage you to. Uh, and if I, I'm already there because I've printed it out. So if you need me to slow down, hold your hand up so I can let, allow you to get to the scripture reference. All right, now we said repentance and obedience are essential features in any biblical uh, understanding of meditation. I want you to notice in Psalm 119, verses 97 through 102, notice the focus upon be obedience and faithfulness. Starting in verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from evil, from every evil path, so I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. Alright, notice. Right off the bat, we said that repentance and obedience are essential features in any biblical understanding of meditation. And right off the bat, from Psalm 119, we see the Psalter talking about obedience to God's Word. And it's right there in conjunction with meditate. And he says meditate like three or four different times. Alright, Genesis 24, 63 is simply an example of one of our patriarchs of our faith meditating. It says, and this is talking about Isaac. He went out to the field one evening to meditate. And as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. All right? Pastor Chip, you remember what those camels were bringing? Bringing silver and gold, if I remember. <laughs> is that right? All right. It's, uh, it may be just as good. A bride. A bride. <laughs> All right. So, um, but I'm, thinking, I'm thinking back to Sheba coming in mm -hmm. to, to Solomon. Yeah, okay. So, the, so we, we see an example here. He's going out to meditate. All right. Notice that he's going out into the field. We're going to talk about that. That's touching on uh, looking to God's creation, uh, which is a style or form of meditation, because the Word tells us that creation itself testifies to the to God Almighty, the Creator of all. All right. Uh, Psalm 119, 48 says, I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. Psalm 1, 1 through 2 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in, the, in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. When? And, and we're told to pray how? Without ceasing. Without ceasing. Do you, are you seeing a theme here? Meditation is not going to... You're going to start off is going to be something that you're going to set up as part of your daily regimen. Okay? We're going to talk about that you're going to want to be intentional on in setting up a time as you start getting into meditation. Most of us probably have not practiced Christian meditation. If we have, we've done it by accident 
because it's not something that the church is, is as a whole is teaching. All right, that's changing. You're part of that change. But the thing is, is that uh, you're going to have to be intentional as you get into this. And what you will see is it will not be just a part of your day. It will become your day. The way that you live your daily life. Okay? All right. So then, uh, just another reference. The old priest Eli knew how to listen to God and help the young boy Samuel to know the word of the Lord. We see that in 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 8. That's one that I'm going to skip for time's sake. All right? It is in your packet. All right? Elijah learned to listen to and uh, to discern the still, small voice of Yahweh in 1 Kings 19, 9 through 18. That's when he was to, uh, God told, told, tells him that he has a remnant. All right? That's after he, he ran and hid in the cave. All right? Uh, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and heard his voice saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? That's Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 8. All right, Jeremiah discovered the word of God to be a burning fire shut up in, in my bones. All right, and that's Jeremiah 20, 9. He says, But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. All right? What these scripture references are pointing to is what is about to happen to you. What you are getting ready to step into. All right? Jesus made a habit of withdrawing to a lonely place apart. All right? Matthew 14, 13 says, When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. All right? There are all kinds of scripture references that point to how Jesus withdrew himself, had time with the Lord, meditated on, on the things of the Lord, on God's word. And we're going to see scripture references here in a minute that are just going to really pull that into distinct focus for us uh, as we continue on tonight. All right, but here's a really big component of our, our study tonight, and that is Exodus, the book of Exodus. We're going to be looking at Exodus 33, verse 11. And what we're talking about now is missed opportunities that you and I can learn from. And this is really big when it comes to the spiritual disciplines. It especially comes into play tonight as we're examining meditation. All right, in Exodus 33, 11, I want you to look at the relationship that Moses has with the Lord. This is a relationship that each and, each and every one of us can have if we will pursue it. All right, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp at his young age. Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. What kind of relationship did Moses have with the Lord? Face to face. All right. One that when you would call him friend. All right. We can have that level of intimacy with our Lord and Savior. Now, I want you to compare the relationship Moses had that we can have with how the people of Israel responded to the same opportunity in Exodus 20, 19. Remember, God called the nation of Israel to Himself and was going to speak to the nation of Israel. And this is the response of the people of Israel to the opportunity that they had to have that type of relationship with, with Yahweh. And it says, And said to Moses, the Israelites, that the people of Israel said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us for we will die. We will die. The people of Israel made the same mistake later when they thought it better to have a human king rather than living under the leadership of the Lord. In 1 Samuel 8, 7, it says, And the Lord told him, Talking to Samuel, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me. 
as their king. So the first question that we have to ask ourselves tonight as we're getting into this study is, are you taking advantage of, am I, are we taking advantage of the opportunities that we have to have the best relationship possible that we have access to with the Lord? Does everybody follow me? Christian meditation, very simply, is the ability to hear God's voice and obey His Word. Alright? Again, I'm going to say Christian meditation, very simply, is the ability to hear God's voice and obey His Word. It involves no hidden mysteries, no secret mantras, no mental gymnastics, no historic flights into the cosmic consciousness. The truth of the matter is that the great God of the universe, the creator of all things, desires our fellowship. It's that simple. Jesus came and taught the reality of the kingdom of God and demonstrated what life could be like in that kingdom. He established a living fellowship that would, uh, that would know him as redeemer and king. Listening to him in all things and obeying him at all times. Those are our roles. He established a living fellowship that would know him as redeemer and king. Listening to him in all things and obeying him at all times in his intimate relationship with the Father, Jesus modeled for us the reality of that life of hearing and obeying. All right? So listen listen to these scripture references. All right? John 5, 19. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Hearing and obeying. John 5.30 By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Hearing and obeying. John 14.10 don't you believe that I am the I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Hearing and obeying. Now, remember what Jesus said. about being a good shepherd. Say that again. I should hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. All right. So John 10, 4. So now his shift, his, he's shifting a little bit. All right. Because now he's talking about our relationship with him. When he was brought, uh, when he has brought all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what, tell you what is yet to come. Who is he talking about there? Hmm? Holy, Spirit. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. All right. In his second volume, Luke clearly implies that following his resurrection and ascension, Jesus continues to do and teach even if people cannot see him with the naked eye. Acts 1.1 says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. But both 
Peter and Stephen point to Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecy in Deuteronomy 18.15 of the prophet like Moses who is to speak and whom the people are to hear and obey. Verse 22, For Moses said, The Lord your God will rise up for you, a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Acts 7, 37, This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. In the book of Acts, we see the resurrected and reigning Christ through the Holy Spirit teaching and guiding his children, us. Leading Philip to a new, un, uh, new unreached cultures, Acts 8. Revealing his messiahship to Paul, Acts 9. Teaching Peter about his Jewish nationalism, Acts 10. Guiding the church out of his cultural captivity, Acts 15. Now let me be very clear here. When I say cultural captivity, I'm not saying that... Hebrew and the Hebrew and, the, and and what the Hebrews do as far as recognizing who God is and the and and uh, observing the feast of the Lord and so on and so forth that that's cultural captivity. What I'm talking about is the cultural captivity that is Judaism that separated from the way when Jesus Christ came into the picture. All right, I'm talking about the religious set of beliefs, the cultural captivity that was part of that as Christianity was coming uh, out of Judaism uh, and becoming uh, the faith that we are a part of today. All right? Uh, we see over and over again is God's people learning to live on the basis of hearing God's voice and obeying His Word. All right? If you look at the New Testament, when you're looking at the New Testament and looking at, especially in the book of Acts, what you're seeing is people learning to live on the basis of hearing God's voice and obeying His Word. This, in brief, forms the biblical foundation of meditation. And the wonderful news is, is that Jesus has not stopped acting and speaking. He is resurrected and working in our world. He is not idle, nor has He developed laryngitis. He is alive and among us us as our priest to forgive us, prophet to teach us, king to rule us, and shepherd to guide us. All right. It's at this point in your packet that you'll have some bonus material there, uh, specifically about the Holy Spirit. All right, and we'll talk about that a little bit more next week as you do your uh, activities and work through your first week of meditation. Uh, then I've also provided you copies of Acts 8, Acts 9, Acts 10, and Acts 15 because we have referenced those scriptures. All right, and it gives you scripture on paper that you can totally mark up and have fun making notes and things like that. Uh, if you don't do that in your Bible, you know, some don't like to do mark the Bible up. Others love to mark the Bibles up, whatever is your preference. But if you don't like to mark the Bible up, you can mark this up. Okay? Alright. So, that takes us to the purpose of meditation. In meditation, we are growing into a familiar Friendship with Jesus. Remember, we talked about Moses, all right, and and the fact that Moses had a face-to-face -face, uh, relationship with God and that was considered a friend of God. Okay, so in meditation, we are growing into a familiar friendship with Jesus. All right, we are coming into the light and life of Christ and becoming comfortable in that posture. The perpetual presence of the Lord, omnipresence as we sometimes call it, moves from a theological dogma into a radiant reality. All right, let's break that sentence down. All right, what we're saying is, what we're being told is, is that the perpetual presence of the Lord, something that we call omnipresent, God is omnipresent. It's one of those things that if you uh, if, if you attend a church where you have to go through um, 
uh, catechism or have to go through, uh, what is it, the Methodists call it? Confirmation. confirmation. It's one of those truths that you have to learn and be able to recite uh, to go through confirmation. All right? Is that God is omnipresent. Omnipresent means he is everywhere. The problem with that is, is that it's a theological thought. It's a theological dogma that we have. We don't apply it to our lives. All right? And what's going to happen is, is as you are meditating and spending time with the Lord, what you're going to start realizing is that He is with you every step of the way throughout the day. You just haven't been accessing Him. I haven't been accessing Him. So what it is, is you're actually stepping into a more intimate relationship with Him. Because what's going to happen is as you meditate, you're going to start hearing from Him. All right? And as you hear from Him, you're going to obey Him. As you obey Him, your relationship is going to grow deeper and deeper and deeper because you're going to see Him providing. You're going to see Him performing miracles. You're going to see Him doing things that is what he does that only strengthens and bolsters your relationship with him, your faith in him, your willingness to take the leap with him. All right? So it becomes a reality instead of a principle, instead of a teaching point. It is life. All right? So... He, uh, so the note here I have is he walks with me and he talks with me. Remember that hymn? And he walks with me and he talks with me. All right. It becomes an accurate description of our daily lives. I don't know about you, but when when I read this and, and, and at times when I've thought about my daily walk with Jesus Christ, there are a lot of times that I, things come into my life and my first reaction and how I handle it maybe for the first time a uh, few hours to the first few days doesn't even involve God in the process. Okay? So this is a huge shift in how we approach life. All right? We have to quit compartmentalizing our faith, work, family life, hobbies, interests, so, so on and so forth. We got to quit compartmentalizing, and everything is through our lens, the lens of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, and this is not some mushy, giddy, buddy, buddy relationship. All such sentimentality only betrays how little we know and how distant we are from the Lord, high and lifted up, who is revealed to us in Scripture. We are seeking and stepping into a reality more akin to what the disciples felt in the upper room where they experienced both intense intimacy and awful reverence. The scene that comes to mind is the revelation that John had on Patmos. All right. Does anybody remember what it says John said he was doing? He was in the Spirit. He was in the Spirit. Right. Was in the spirit. These are spiritual disciplines. He was practicing the disciplines. All right, He was in the Spirit. And then Jesus revealed himself. And you remember the description. We're going to read it here in a little bit. But do you remember the description of Jesus? Yeah. I mean, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. Like I said, we're going to look at it here in just a second. But for, for those of us in the past that have been like, oh, Jesus is my buddy. When you look at that description, Jesus is your Lord. He's your king. All right? He loves you intimately, but, but don't lose the reverence of who he is and who we are in relationship to him. Okay? In fact, here it is, Revelation 1, 12 through 17. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was, lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. This is John, the beloved. 
the disciple. This is John who was in the inner circle. This is John who was really good friends with Jesus. And what was his reaction? I fell at his feet as though dead. Then, now look, look, John understood his relationship in reference to Jesus Christ. He understood who he was and who Jesus was. And he reacted properly. And look at how Jesus received him. Look at how Jesus received him. And this is how Jesus receives you. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. All right? There in your packet is again a, a, another area on miracles and asking you what you believe on miracles and so on and so forth. But continue on on with medit meditation. What happens in meditation is that we create the emotional and spiritual space which allows Christ to construct an inner sanctuary in our heart. Revelation 3.20 is often one of the most misinterpreted scripture references as addressing the lost. Its original intended audience is actually Christians or believers. We who have turned our lives over to Christ need to know how very much he longs to eat with us, to commune with us. Meditation opens the door, and although we are engaging in specific exercises at specific times, the aim is to bring this living reality into all of life it is a portable sanctuary that is brought into all we are and do. And Revelation 3.20 is, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Inward fellowship of this kind transforms the inner personality. We cannot burn the eternal flame of the inner sanctuary and remain the same. For the divine fire will consume everything that is impure. Our ever-present teacher will always be leading us into righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17. Everything that is foreign to his way, we will have to let go. In fact, we will want to, for our desires and aspirations will be more and more conformed to His way. Increasingly, everything within us will swing like a needle to the pole star of the Spirit. Pole star meaning directing principle, guide, center of attraction. Like a magnet to the North Pole. The more time that we spend with Him in meditation, in real relationship, the more we will want to serve Him, please Him, honor Him, glorify Him, live for Him. Everything within us will swing like a needle to the pole star of the Spirit. Now, before we get into the mechanics of meditation, I want you to understand that there are some misconceptions about meditation. Whenever the Christian idea of meditation is taken seriously, there are those who assume that it is synonymous with the concept of meditation centered in Eastern religions. In reality, the two ideas stand worlds apart. Eastern meditation is an attempt to empty the mind. Christian meditation is an attempt to fill the mind. The two are quite different. Eastern forms of meditation stress the need to become detached from the world. There is an emphasis upon losing personhood and individuality and merging with the cosmic mind. There is a longing to be freed from the burdens and pains of this life and to be released into the impersonality of nirvana. 
personal identity is lost, and in fact, personality is seen as the ultimate illusion. There is an escaping from the miserable will of existence. There is no God to be attached to or to hear from. Detachment is the final goal of Eastern religion. Christian meditation goes far beyond the notion of detachment. There is a need for detachment, a Sabbath of contemplation, as Peter of Celis, a Benedictine monk of the 12th century, put it. But there is a danger in thinking only in terms of detachment, as Jesus indicates in his story of the man who had been emptied, by, emptied of evil, but not filled with good. Luke 11, 24 through 26 says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through uh, a rid place of seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. The biggest hurdle that we have as we begin looking at the spiritual disciplines, as we really start to dig in, is understanding that it's real. It is real. Demon possessions are real. Demonic oppression is real. The Holy Spirit is real. The spirit realm is real. The spirit realm interacts with us whether we want it to or not. It's real. We have ways to interact that God has provided for us to interact and access the spiritual realm. We have power in the spiritual realm through the authority of Jesus Christ. We have to believe that before any type of spiritual discipline will work. No detachment is not enough. We must go on to attachment. The detachment from the confusion uh, around us uh, is in order to have a richer attachment to God. Christian meditation leads us to the inner wholeness necessary to give ourselves to God freely. Another misconception about meditation is that it is too complicated. Thomas Merton writes, meditation is really very simple and there's not much need to elaborate techniques to teach us how to go about it. It's really quite simple, and you're going to see that here in just a few moments. Because that's what I'm that's what I'm driving at or driving to is how <coughs> we engage the Lord through meditation. A third misconception is to view contemplation or imp as impractical and holy out of touch with the 20th century. You would be surprised at how common this is now. Remember, we've been programmed. All right, everything's at a touch of a button. Contemplation is not. Contemplation requires something of you. Such evaluations are far from the mark. In fact, meditation is the one thing that can sufficiently redirect our lives so that we can deal with the human life successfully. Meditation has no point and no reality unless it is firmly rooted in life. Historically, no group has stressed the need to enter into the, last, uh, the listening silences more than the Quakers, and the results have been a vital social impact far in excess of their numbers. William Penn notes the following, true godliness, and godliness is the pursuit of godliness, uh, becoming more like Christ. True godliness does not turn men out of the world, but enables them to live better in it and excites their endeavors to mend it. Perhaps the most common misconception of all is to view meditation as a religious form of psychological manipulation. If you don't believe some of these misconceptions, I double dog dare you to share with some of your Christian friends that are not here tonight that, hey, this week I'm, I'm learning and starting to meditate uh, practice Christian meditation 
and see what kind of objections you get. Perhaps the most misconception, common most misconception of all is to view meditation as a religious form of psychological manipulation. This reveals how a person views creation. If you feel we live in a purely physical universe, you will view meditation as a good way to obtain a consistent alpha brainwave pattern. But if you believe in a universe created by the infinite personal God who delights in our communion with Him, you will see meditation as a communication between the lover and the one beloved. As we saw earlier in the examples of the Israelites, now this is important. This, this is so important because as you break the shackles of religiosity that we've been programmed under, you're going to encounter others that are still shackled. All right? Listen to this. As we saw earlier in examples of the Israelites, remember when they had the opportunity to have the relationship that Moses had, and they said, no, 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 you, you, you talk to God for us. All right? And then their descendants choosing to have a human king rather than uh, living under the rulership of Yahweh. We, you know, we, stupid Israelites, but, you know, that's how we, that's how we, you know, stupid Israelites, you know, we would have made that mistake. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, all right. As we saw earlier in the examples of the Israelites, humans, humans, that's all of us, tend to want someone to speak to God for them, for us. This, hear me, hear me, because this, this is what you're going to be fighting when you're sharing the delight of meditation with the Lord with others. This is why meditation is so, so threatening to us as believers today. It boldly calls us to enter the, into the living presence of God for ourselves. It tells us that God is speaking in the continuous present and wants to address us. The line is being drawn in the sand. What kind of relationship do you want? Do you want what the Israelites had? Well, they, they know of God. They've seen God's work. They saw the cloud around the mountain, the lightning, the fire. They saw the splitting of the Red Sea. They saw God at work, working around them and providing for them and delivering them. But they didn't want the accountability of a personal, intimate relationship. There was perceived protection. Pastor Chip, stand up. Perceived protection in having someone speak to God for me because he's my pastor. He speaks to God. God speaks to him so that he can come to church on Sunday morning and speak to me. So God tells Chip what to say to me. Right? In part. In part. In part. But what are my Yes, ma'am, go ahead. In our ministry, we depend heavily on God talking to us, especially in the process of doing the river. We depend heavily on Him telling us what to say, how to say it, you know, what, what, what to minister to our people. Mm -hmm. And I have had people tell me many a time, that's exactly what I was thinking. That was exactly what I was feeling. Or, you know, and I remember telling this one lady one time, you can't give up on God now. You cannot give up on God at this point in your life. And she looked at me, how did you know that? How did you know I was <laughs> and, and I told her, that's what God told me. And people t talk to us and say, how do you get God to talk to you? I can't get God to talk to me. I said, well, you spend time with him and he'll talk to you. Absolutely. He has something to say to each and every one of us. And and not just one thing to say. Um, look, look. Would it be blasphemous to say that the Lord definitely possesses the gift of gab? 
He wants to talk with you, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a direction to go uh, share the gospel in Korea or in Australia or in uh, you know uh, Kuwait. Uh, it could be, but more than likely, what you're going to experience at first is just Him letting you know that He loves you. That He loves you in it. And, and building that relationship and communicating with you. And he'll communicate with you through his word. He'll communicate with you through prayer. He'll communicate with you uh, through his creation. He'll communicate with you through other Christians, other believers. He'll communicate with you through your circumstances. I think at first, when you're trying to discern that for mm -hmm. the first times, you don't know if you're just having a, a random thought that jumps in your head like you do when you're watching TV and want ice cream. You don't discern it as a as God at all. You just kind of hang it off the wall somewhere. But I find that for me, because um, you know, it takes a long time to mature in certain areas, that when the thought keeps coming back, you know, and it's the same one mm -hmm. and it's kind of like when you have a parent who keeps saying, Did you do it yet? Did yeah. you do it yet? Then it kind of sinks in for me. Mm -hmm. At first I didn't even recognize God was trying to talk to me, and, and I think that over time you start to realize, why does that keep coming back? And it's like, oh wait, I was just talking to God, and now something keeps coming around. Maybe that's not just me getting distracted this time, because it's over and over. Mm -hmm. So there's this opportunity that we're talking about, and and as we as we as we're delving into it, Romans one twenty one. We gotta we gotta look at it and recognize it. Romans 121 says, For although they knew God, although they knew God, they neither neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's really the, the two choices that we have here. All right? You can try to stay where you are, but, but we all know that if we try to stay where we are, that's just going to end up coming over here. And you're going to end up being adequately described in Romans 121. But if we step into this intimate relationship and we, we practice the disciplines, not because it's a chore list, not because uh, uh, you know, your church staff said, hey, these are good and you should do these, but because you want to pursue an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why you're going to do this. And if you do them for any other reason, you will not be, it, it is not sustainable. It, it becomes legalistic. This is why meditation is so, again, threatening to us. It boldly calls us to enter the living presence of God for ourselves. It tells us that God is speaking in the continuous present and wants to address us. So with that in mind, let's talk about the basics of meditation. Now, today's been lecture-based more than last week was. Next week will be very much table talk because we're talking about prayer, the discipline of prayer. Or actually, it'll be the week after um, the gathering. Yes, ma'am. Was um, conversations I've had with my husband, if it helps anyone, to be encouraged when I don't want to do something, I know I should do it. I can't change that. But my husband would say, God can change your want to. You need to pray for the want to. Mm -hmm. You know? If, even if you just know it's right, you can't force yourself to hunger for something. But you can ask God, give me a hunger. Mm -hmm. And that's different than lining up just to be in the legal way of it, you know? Absolutely. You still step forward, but it's, yeah. it's a good. Thank you. You're exactly right. And, and listen. As we as as we start this, all right. There's going to be some intentionality to it, but you're going to find a a, a a zone or a groove that works with you and the Lord, all right. Because remember, He created you uniquely. He knows how you tick, all right. And 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 you'll find your niche with Him uh, and be able to kind of build your own regimen, so to speak. But these are, these are suggestions starting off. Number one, 
Be intentional in setting aside, excuse me, setting aside a time to meditate each day. Two, be intentional in setting aside a specific place to meditate. A lot of times we can waste time looking for a place if we don't already have a place designated for such, okay? Uh, we will look at this more in detail when we look at the discipline of solitude, all right? So this will come back up. But you want to find a quiet place free from interruptions and no phone. No phone. Perhaps with a view of God's creation. Perhaps with a view of God's creation. We'll get into that more here in just a second. Number three, be intentional in your posture. All right? Again, this is something that just starting off, this is just a suggestion. All right? Sit in a chair with good support, both feet on the floor, hands on your knees, palms up in a gesture of receptivity, of receiving. Be attentive. Remember, you are entering into the presence of of the one true living God. All right. So, if you're if you're dragging and you know falling asleep and everything, you just picture in your mind that you, you're coming into the presence of Yahweh. If you could, if, I mean, if you could really, I mean, if you could, and, and and the thing is, is you are really doing it. But if you could see that. If you could see it, you would approach it differently than with one sock off, you know, holding your coffee, haven't brushed your teeth yet, uh, kind of, you know, I'm not saying that you can't enter into his presence like that, but as you recognize who he is and who you are in relationship to him, you're good. that time's going to be special, Okay. I'm not saying you have to wear your Sunday best. I'm not saying you can't wear your pajamas. I'm just saying you want to be attentive. You want to be ears perked up, awake. You know, you 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 want to relish in that moment. Okay. Contemplative prayer, which goes back to praying without ceasing. Contemplative prayer, same thing. Contemplative prayer is is a state of mind. As you walk throughout your day, all right. Contemplative prayer is a natural outflowing of meditation, all right. So, contemplative prayer is going to be a natural outflow of your time with the Lord, all right. And that the the scripture reference there is First Thessalonians five sixteen through eighteen. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So meditation leads to contemplative prayer or that state of mind, and it builds a sense of balance in life, an ability to be at peace through the activities of the day. <clears throat> Instead of the day controlling you, you are now in control of your day because you are walking with the creator of the very day that you exist in. It's a sense of balance in life, an ability to be at peace through the activities of the day, the ability to rest and take time to enjoy beauty, and ability to pace ourselves. Some are more visual than others. With this in mind, some who practice Christian meditation have shared that discipline comes to them easier when they close their eyes to remove distractions and center their attention on Jesus. At other times, it may be helpful to ponder a picture of the Lord or look out uh, at some lovely trees and plants for the same purpose. Regardless of how it is done, the aim is to center the attention of the body, the emotions, the mind, and the spirit upon the glory of God in the face of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Now, meditation upon Scripture is central, is central to Christian meditation, to all forms of meditation. And that meditation upon Scripture keeps it in its proper 
perspective. You follow me? Yes. All right. Now, whereas the study of Scripture centers on exegesis, finding the true meaning of what, what is it really saying, uh, making sure that it, it is biblically accurate as far as what other portions of Scripture say, so on and so forth, we'll get into that when we look at Bible intake. Meditation of Scripture centers on internalizing and personalizing the message. All right, so it's not a word study. It's, it, it, it's You're just looking at how the script, how you internalize the scripture and personalizing the passage. The living word becomes a living word addressed to you. This is not a time for technical studies or analysis or the gathering of material to share with others. Set aside all tendencies towards arrogance and with a humble heart receive the word addressed to you. Resist the temptation to pass over many uh, passages. Our rushing Remember, you're coming into the presence of God. Our rushing reflects our internal state, and our internal state is what needs to be transformed. Be patient. Take a single event or a parable or a few verses or even a single word and allow it to take root in you. Seek to live the experience. Smell the seed. Hear the lap of water along the shore. See the crowd. Feel the sun on your head and the hunger in your stomach as Jesus gets ready to perform a miracle. Taste the salt in the air. Touch the hem of his garment. All right? Now, suppose that we want to meditate on Jesus' staggering statement, my peace I give you in John 14, 27. Our task is not so much to study the passage as it is to be initiated into the reality of of which the passage speaks. In other words, to step into that. We brood on the truth that He is now filling us with His peace. The heart, the mind, and the spirit are awakened to His inflowing peace. We sense all motions of fear stilled and overcome and overcome by power and love and self-control. What 2 Timothy 1.7 states. Rather than dissecting peace, we are entering into it. We are enveloped, absorbed, gathered into his peace. Does everybody follow me so far? Always remember that we enter the story not as passive observers, but as active participants. Always remember that Christ is truly with us to teach us, to heal us, to forgive us. Now, another form of Christian medication is called recollection or centering down. All right? It's also referred to as palms down, palms up. All right? You're going to begin by placing your palms down as a symbolic indication of your desire to turn over any concerns you may have for God. Inwardly, you may pray, Lord, I give you my anger toward John. I release my anxiety over not having enough money to pay the bills this month. I release my frustration over trying to find a babysitter tonight. Release it. You may even feel a certain release in your hands. That's what I'm saying. It's real. It's real. It's not a concept. It's not a, it's not a precept. It's not a principle. It's real. And you may feel something. It's real. After several moments of surrender, turn your palms up as if a symbol, as if symbolic of your desire to receive from the Lord. And perhaps you will pray silently and say, Lord, I would like to receive your divine love for John. So you gave up the anger for John, and now you're receiving the love for John. Um, receive, I receive your peace about the dentist appointment. <laughs> I receive your patience, your joy. Whatever you need, you say, palms up. All right? 
<laughs> All right, that's our that's our alarm. All right. So I having we center, were, I thought we had achieved somewhere in meditation. I thought hey, we're here. I'm here music. All right. Having centered down, spend the remaining moments in complete silence. Silence is, is golden. Okay? Silence is golden. Do not ask for anything. Allow the Lord to commune with you, to love you. If impressions and directions come, fine. If they don't, fine. Okay? A third, time, a third kind of contemplative prayer is meditation upon creation. This is what I was referring to earlier. The creator of the universe shows us something of his glory through, create, through his creation. The heavens do indeed declare the glory of God, and the firmament does show forth his handiwork, Psalm 19, 1. So give your attention to the created order. Uh, look at the trees. Really look at them. Really look at them. Take a flower and allow its beauty and symmetry to seep deep into your mind and heart. Listen to the birds. They are messengers of God. Watch the little creatures that creep upon the earth. These are humble acts to be sure, but sometimes God reaches us profoundly in these simple ways if we will quiet ourselves and listen. There's a fourth form of meditation that is in some ways quite the opposite of the one just given. And some of you are already practicing this one. It is to meditate upon the events of our time and to seek to perceive their significance. We have a spiritual obligation to penetrate the inner meaning of events, not to gain power, but to gain prophetic perspective. We would do well to hold the events of our time before God and ask for, for prophetic insight to discern where these things will lead. Further, we should ask for guidance for anything we personally should be doing to be salt and light in our decaying and dark world. Finally, you must not be discouraged if in the beginning your meditations have little meaning to you. There is a progression in the spiritual life, and it is wise to have some experience with lesser peaks before trying to conquer Mount Everest, <laughs> the Mount Everest of the soul. So be patient with yourself. Besides, you are learning a discipline for which you have received no training. Nor does our culture encourage you to develop these skills. You are going against the grain. You will be going against the tide. But take heart. Your task is of immense worth. Now, this week, what I would like you to do over the next, over the course of the next few weeks, is um, we're going to start putting your packet together. All right, uh, put it in a notebook. Like I said, there's some areas in there to help you study and think about things. Uh, little exercises to try to start that paradigm shift where we, we quit living so much in the physical world and begin stepping into and living through the spiritual world, okay? So uh, I want you to do that over the course of the next two weeks and I want you to set aside time each day whether it be five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it may be, and meditate on your favorite scripture. Okay? And meditate on your favorite scripture. And remember, put yourself in it. Put your name in it. See yourself. See Jesus speaking to you. Use the senses that he has given you, that he's provided you with. Put yourself there. See his smile. Feel his touch. Recognize his love. Spend that time with him. Any questions? We crammed a lot of information into an hour. And we did it that way because next week is the gathering and I figured anything we did today we would lose by the time we got back together in two weeks. That's another reason why I've done a packet for you. All of you have been invited to the face group page. Only three people are on it right now. If you have not gotten the invite, let me know and I'll try to resend it. All right? But that way, if you have questions, you can have post questions on our Facebook page, so on and so forth. Okay? All right? So, uh, Pastor Chip, uh, Steve, and uh, Curtis, will you help me for just a second? Uh, passing out uh, the handouts.
I'm going to get Luke to do it for me. Okay. Luke? 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 Show me some grace. Yeah. 